some backstory. Uh, I was on a conference three weeks ago, uh, Salman Summit 2023. Uh, I was asked, what is the status of North Atlantic Salmon? For the audience there, I pointed towards this uh, working group, which I'm a member of, CIC's working group on North Atlantic Salmon, which addresses questions from the North Atlantic Salmon Conservation Organization, NASCO, which has been mentioned here prior. Now, NASCO has uh, three different commission areas, and as uh, our minister pointed out earlier today, uh, currently we are not a member, but Iceland is going to take steps to become a member of NASCO. And this is interesting to me. Why? Well, there are some management objectives that you have to fulfill when you are a member of NASCO. Uh, and the action plan for application of precautionary approach, which was uh, uh, decided in 1999, provides interpretation of how this is to be achieved as follows. Management measures should be aimed at maintaining all stocks above their conservation limits by the use of management targets. Currently, today in Iceland, uh, this is not the case. So we do not manage our stocks according to biological reference points. Therefore, I wanted to take you through an exercise to look at biological reference points, and the case study today is River Selau in the northeast, one of the six rivers. Uh, conservation limits for North Atlantic salmon stock complexes have been defined as the level of stock, which often is number of spawners, that will achieve long-term average maximum sustainable yield. Uh, how, do we how do we find the number of spawners needed for maximum sustainable yield? There is a mathematical equation uh, which uh, takes the number of spawners and looks at the recruitment following uh, increase in, in the number of uh, spawners. Here we are using number of eggs. So if we are increase our eggs on the x-axis, we should get higher recruits up to a certain point, uh, which is the carrying capacity of that particular river. How do we calculate this? Well, ideally, we need river-specific data. For the rivers in northeast, the MFRI, which I'm a, a, uh, an employee, we have been monitoring these rivers for more than 40 years. Uh, with this data, we can observe strength of different year classes. We can look at changes in growth rate. We can look at changes in density. We can monitor effects of environmental changes and also monitor success of man-made actions, past and present. For example, uh, hatchery introduction, moving breeding pairs, egg planting, catch and release, and increasing accessible areas with fish ladders. So, the spawning stock, the number of eggs, is our starting point. That's the X axis. We can look at recruitment throughout the life history of salmon, either through the uh, pars, the smolts, or the salmon at sea, and then returning adults. Or and then or we can finish the uh, life cycle all the way to breeding pairs again. For the exercise today, we're going to look at spawning stocks and these guys. And this is the data, River Sela. This is the par density that we have uh, surveyed since 1979. And I think you can all see there are two periods. This one and this one. Dramatic pause. Uh, what is happening? And to spoil it, uh, Pete has already given you the answer. So the blue period 
all the cats was retained. And then we started catch and release. And this is the effect. Quite obvious. We are increasing the number of eggs in the river with catch and release. So, using this information, the number of eggs and the part density, we can start looking at this equation. And let's plot the data. This is the data. And you can easily see that with increasing X, we get higher density of juveniles. Well, there are some outliers, interesting outliers. For example, this one and these two guys here. Uh, we've heard earlier today uh, that temperature can be a problem if it's too warm, for example, in the River D. But in this particular part of the world, the, more, the higher the temperature, the better, because we are uh, uh, closer to the zero degrees of Celsius than 23 degrees of Celsius. So again, this is cumulative uh, temperature, like uh, uh, Rasmus was using earlier. And the higher the temperature, the better the growth. Let's explore the temperature data. This is monthly uh, anomalies in River Selao. So blue is colder than average, and, and red is warmer than average. Uh, on the y-axis, it goes from minus 3 up to 3. So the difference between the coldest month and the warmest month is about 6 degrees Celsius. I want to point out spawning events. 2014, which was followed by one of the coldest years that we have in our temperature records. Then spawning event of 2016, which was followed by one of the warmest years in our measurements. And also 2012, cold uh, period after the spawning. 2017, a warm period. Now, here we have a graph. Uh, to the left, we have a standard deviation mean from hatching time. So it takes the eggs a certain amount of degree days to hatch. The warmer the period is, the earlier they hatch, the colder it is, the later it hatch. So on the left, we have warm years, on the, cold, on, the, on the right, we have cold years. And again, on the y-axis, it's juvenile density. And what happens? If it's cold, we can expect fewer uh, juveniles compared to when it's warm. Remember the years I pointed out. 2014, cold period. 2016, warm period. These are the points here. The other outlier there on the bottom is 1978, and we don't have uh, temperature measurements from that particular year. So, if we go back to our calculations, this means that when we do uh, our estimates, trying to find our uh, maximum sustainable yield, there can be both differences between rivers, but also quite a large difference between years. So 2014 would be similar to the blue line, and 2016, not showing there, sorry, is, would be the gray line. Conservation limits, again, for North Atlantic salmon stock complexes have been defined as the level of stock number of spawners that will achieve long term, and then there I've highlighted the, in red, average maximum sustainable yield. So our uh, object here is trying to find the average number that uh, will give us maximum sustainable yield. We've done this for Selau, River Selau, and here I've plotted it on the uh, ag figure, and you can see that we have been above that particular level since uh, around 2000. Okay. We have increased the eggs, but what about the catches? 
Pete has already shown this today. Well, the catches go up in some years, but on average, they're similar to the period of retained catch. Why aren't our stocks increasing with increasing catch and release and increasing number of eggs? Uh, I want to point out you out to this paper here, written by Gerald Caput, Overview of the Status of Atlantic Salmon in the North Atlantic and Trends in Marine Mortality. Why? Well, the reason is that what we see in River Selao, we see elsewhere. And this has been mentioned uh, today as well. The panel on the left is the number of spawners, which has remained quite stable in the North Atlantic and the North uh, in uh, North America. But the returns to home waters, with the, which is the middle panel, has been going down, and the pre-fishery abundance as well. Uh, NASCO points out quite uh, nicely with this figure that prior to 1990, 1,000 eggs should return one salmon uh, in that period. But since 2007, we have needed 2,000 eggs for the same return. So this is what is happening in River Sello. We are maintaining the number of cats, we're not increasing them. So cats and release has remained uh, our cats numbers. Uh, simply because we need more eggs than the earlier period. Why is that? Well, we've heard a lot of interesting talk about it. I want to point out this very good paper from our Norwegian colleagues. There are major threats to the Atlantic salmon. We have problems uh, that are well known and well documented. Uh, on top of the list there is, is escaped farmed salmon and salmon lice for the Norwegian uh, stocks. Some are local, others are large scale. However, looking at stock complexes masks the regional and river specific situation for Atlantic salmon population. This is the reason that NASCO is asking us to look at river specific conservation limits. And if I go back to uh, Gerald's paper, the message is clear. Now, more than ever, maintenance and expansion of diverse river-specific monitoring and assessment programs are required. The availability of many river-specific assessments is crucial to improving knowledge because such assessments will provide the foundation for testing hypotheses of factors that define salmon population abundance and regulation and for rational management. And in my mind, the Six Rivers project is such a, a, a project. We have long-term monitoring data from the MFRI, uh, the old guys. And then we have some new research, uh, which we will uh, hear a little bit about later on from Sami and Olivia. And together, this produces some happily anglers in good hands. Thanks.